Everybody say, thank God for the word. Thank God for the word. Praise the Lord. Well, we've been in a series uh, entitled God's Will is Health. Everybody say, God's will, God's will. is health. Yes. Amen. God didn't create you and have you born on this, this earth to be sick and weak. Amen. Amen. He had us to be born so we could be strong and healthy and do great exploits for him. Amen. Amen. And uh, First John, or Third John, uh, verse 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Uh, in, in the uh, King James Version, the standard King James, it says, Beloved, I wish or pray above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul or as thy soul prospers. Above all things. Everybody say above all things. Above all things. Now John is praying by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit here. And the Holy Spirit led him to pray that above all things that we would prosper and be in health even as our soul prospers. And uh, I'll talk about how that in order for us to fulfill God's plan for our lives. How many of you know that God has a plan for your life? Every one of us. Everybody say, God has a plan, God has a plan. for my life. And in order to fulfill that plan for, that God has for your life, you need two things. You need provision and you need health. Amen? Amen. Amen. You've got to be healthy to do what God's called you to do. And you have to have provision. It, how many of you know it takes money to do anything? It takes money to go to the bank to get money. That's right. <laughs> it takes money to put gas in your car to go to the store. And we live in a society that is run by money. And, uh, you know, in, in earlier years it was run by agriculture and, and other things, but now it, it, our currency is money. And so in order for us to do anything and to do what God's called us to do, in order to do anything, whether you're doing serving God or serving the devil, it takes money. But how many of you want to serve God? Amen? Well, it takes provision. And John prayed, I wish above all things that you may prosper. If I say prosper. And then you have to be healthy. You have to have enough, enough health and strength to be able to do what God's called you to do. Now, I know that there are people that have done great things with great handicaps. And thank God they're, they're inspirational. That's a, that's a powerful testimony. You can do things even with limited health. But how many of you know you can do more when you're healthy than when you're sick? Amen. Amen. Amen? And, and we've seen, thank God, the, the people that have overcome great obstacles, thank God for them. There's no condemnation for that if you're sick, if you're struggling in your health. There's no condemnation. Remember, we're under grace. and We're not under law. We're not under legalism. And there's grace for every situation. And we're not legalistic about it, but at the same time, we are going to stand on the Word of God. We're going to believe God for total health in every area of our life. Amen. And so God wants us to prosper. He wants us to be in health. And uh, we've talked about that. We talk, in the first message, we talked about how that we need to forget. If you're going to walk in, in health uh, and in prosperity, we need to learn how to forget. Forget the failures. Forget the things that, that bring questions uh, to our minds and that, that bring doubt and unbelief into the equation. Forget those things. We're always going to have things maybe in our past that, that raise questions that we don't know the answer to. You know, I don't know why you know, somebody died or why somebody didn't get healed or whatever. But instead of focusing on the failures and focusing on the things that raise questions, we need to forget those things. Paul wrote in Philippians, he said that, that I, I count everything in my past as rubbish so that I may seek and and follow after God that I may know Christ and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death that I may, may by any means attain unto the resurrection of the dead. And he goes and he says, not that I've attained unto this, but this one thing I do, forgetting. Everybody say forgetting. forgetting. So Paul said, I need to forget the things of the past. We need to forget the failures. And also in a sense, we need to forget the successes. Don't let a past victory be the only thing that defines you. You still have a future. Amen. Amen. Everybody say, I've still got a future. If you're still breathing, if you're still walking around on God's green earth, if you're still 
functioning on this planet, God has a reason for you to be here. And until that purpose is fulfilled, you need to keep looking ahead, not just behind. Thank God we, we mark our victories and we celebrate them and we remember them, but we also forget them in the, in the sense that we don't let them stop us from moving ahead in the future. Amen? And we've all got victories in our past and we, we need to thank God for it. They help us and, and they're milestones in our lives and, and they're good things, but, and we celebrate them, but we need to look forward and keep remember that God has a bi even a bigger plan for our future. Yes. Amen? Amen? And so we, then we talked about the, the next uh, point is we need to remember. You know, just like we need to forget some things, we need to remember some things. We need to remember the promises of God. How I many of you know there are promises in the Word of God? And the Bible says that we have a new covenant, a better covenant based on better promises. Everybody say promises. A promise is is a good thing, especially from a good God. Now, you know, there's some people are evil, some people are bad, and they say, "I promise, I'm going to get even with you." Well, God says, "I promise, I'm going to bless you." Every punishment for every failure in your life has already been dealt on Jesus, so that that leaves nothing but the promises of blessing. Amen. Jesus took the curse so that the blessing would be on us. Amen? Amen. Amen. I say, thank God for the blessing. Thank God for the blessing. And in order to walk in the blessings of God, we need to lay hold of the promises of God. Every blessing of God is, starts off as a promise. Amen? Amen? Say that with me. Every blessing from God starts off as a promise. The reason that it works that way is because God operates by faith. In order for you to have faith, you need a word from God because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so in order to walk in the promises of God, you need to, in order to walk in the blessings of God, you need to find out what the promise is. And the promise gives you a word to stand in faith for. When you stand in faith for it, that pleases God and that Op, that, that motivates and, and puts God in motion to fulfill that promise as a blessing. God sits on his throne waiting and anxiously looking to bless us. And he blesses us by giving us promises. We lay hold on those promises and then we receive the blessing. Amen. That's, that is basically the cycle that it works in. Mm -hmm. We have a better covenant based on better promises. So because of that, we walk by faith, not by under the law, but by faith. Amen? And God has poured out his goodness in us. And I talked last week about how that, uh, or last service, about how that God, without faith, it's not possible to please God. Everybody say, please God. So when God is pleased, he pours out and demonstrates his pleasure in us. And so that, what that tells me is that we need to learn how to walk and operate and function in the pleasure of God. When you think about it that way, that, that's, a, that's a good thing. Everything we do is, is an outreach of the pleasure of God in us because we walk by faith. When you walk by law, you cannot ever fulfill the law. Only Jesus could. So God's never pleased by us walking simply by the law because we can't fulfill the law. But when we walk by faith, Jesus has already fulfilled the law. What the law could not do because of the weakness of our flesh, God did by sending Jesus. So Jesus fulfilled every law. Every law that God had, Jesus fulfilled. Now, because of that, we walk by faith in Jesus and God is well pleased. Not because of what we do, but because of what we believe. Remember when Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water and the voice came from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, God said that before Jesus did anything. He had not raised one person from the dead. Not one person had been healed. Water was still water. It hadn't been walked on yet. It wasn't wine. It was water. Every miracle that Jesus would do had not happened at that point. All he had done is simply 
obeyed God in baptism, which is a demonstration of faith. Our, when, we're, when we are baptized, we're just demonstrating that we believe in Jesus. We're identifying with Jesus instead of our flesh. Amen? And so Jesus was baptized as a picture of what faith would be for us. And as a result, God spoke and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Before he did anything, God is pleased by our faith. Now that faith, when God pours out his pleasure in us in response to our faith, then we operate and function and in the pleasure of God. We ought to be demonstrations to the world of God's pleasure. Not demonstrations to the world of God's anger. Amen? Amen. Boy, that's good preaching, Pastor Steve. <laughs> Amen. Everybody say, I am a demonstration, am a demonstration to, the to the world of God's pleasure, of God's pleasure. Not, God's not God's anger. Amen. So God's pleased when we walk by faith. And so we need to remember the blessings. Remember the promises of God. In Psalm 103, uh, the Bible says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Psalm 103, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not. Everybody say, forget not. Forget not. Well, when we forget not, we remember. Forget not, or in other words, remember all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins or iniquities. Who heals all your diseases. Who redeems your Life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things. Amen? Amen. Now, I believe that means a couple of things. I mean, that, I believe that means we, he, he satisfies our mouth with what we eat, what, what gives us health, what we eat, you know, brings health to our bodies. But also, he puts the right thoughts in our minds and words in our mouth. And we speak God's word, who satisfies our mouth with good things. We are, by, by the blessings of God, we're able and empowered to speak blessings and to declare good things so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. Your youth is renewed like the eagles by what you say. And I talked about how the, you know, I've heard a preacher say one time, and, and, and I've heard preachers, you know, several preachers mentioned this, that eagles, when they get to be a certain age, that their beaks get overgrown and they fly up into high into the mountains and they beat their beak against the rock and knock off, and basically knock their beak off and then because they can't eat, they, their feathers fall off and they're, they're up there. And then before long, their beak grows back in and it's fresh. And then they, because they're able to eat, then their feathers grow back. And all that is is just religious junk. I mean, it's not nothing true about that. It's, you don't have a beakless, featherless eagle up there in the mountains. What, about, what a horrible looking creature that would be. <laughs> but eagles are in a constant state of renewal. Yes. They molt in a circular fashion, and, and they're, they're constantly, they, they molt, in a, molt in a rotational fashion. When, when they're losing some feathers, others are growing back in. They never lose their ability to soar. They never lose their ability to, to soar like an eagle. They're constantly a state of renewal. And that's how we are supposed to be. We're not supposed to be just, just run till we run down and then go up in the mountain and, and knock our beaks off and lose all our feathers and then just you know slowly regain our strength. That, that sounds religious, but it's not true. We should be in, a, be in a constant state of renewal. How does that happen? By what comes out of our mouth. He satisfies our mouth with good things so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. We ought to talk health. It doesn't matter what you feel like. You need to talk strength. Let the weak say, I am strong. When you wake up and you don't feel good, don't talk about how you don't feel good. Talk about how good God is. And start confessing the word of God. And, and, you know, people say, well, that's just mind over matter. No, that's faith. Faith speaks. Everybody say, faith speaks. faith speaks. And so we need to learn to talk like God talks. Amen? Amen. We need to, now, I'm not saying just that we, we say something didn't happen. I, I heard some people say, well, you know, they, they, 
some people got a hold of the word of faith type preaching and they got into a car wreck and got out of the car and said, I confess that didn't happen and got in their car and just drove off. Well, that's, that's, that's not faith. That's a lie. If it happened, it happened. Amen? But we do call those things which be not as though they are. We don't call things as they are as though they're not. We call the things that are not as though they are. So when you wake up and you don't feel good, our confession should be, by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. I am the healed. It doesn't matter what I feel like, I'm healed. Amen? Amen. And, uh, yeah, I've shared this with some of you, but, uh, but I woke up about five or six weeks ago one morning, and I couldn't hear. My hearing was gone. And I went to the doctor, and he gave me some steroids and some medication, and I took it, and, and it got worse. And so I went to an ear, nose, and throat specialist, and they did some tests, and they diagnosed me with, sudden, with bilateral sudden sensory neural hearing loss, which is a rare condition that you can wake up. Basically what it means is you wake up one morning and you can't hear. And uh, you know, I, went to, I had a skin rash a few years ago. I went to a uh, uh, skin doctor. Uh, what, do you, what do you call a skin doctor? What's, what's a dermatologist. dermatologist, yeah. And I went to a dermatologist, and I had a rash on my arm. And he said, what are you here for? And I said, I got a rash on my arm. So he got a little microscope thing and looked at everything. And, and I said, okay, well, I'll give you a prescription. And I said, well, what's the diagnosis? He said, you got dermatitis. Okay, so I went home and I thought, well, man, I got dermatitis. I got out the dictionary and looked it up. You know what it means? It means skin rash. <laughs> I paid $200 to tell a doctor I had a skin rash, and he told me I had a skin rash in Latin. <laughs> I got my money's worth. <laughs> and the prescription didn't even work. I just used some over-the-counter stuff, and it got better. But anyway... Thank God for doctors. Amen. Amen. But I woke up and I couldn't hear. And I told Rachel, I said, you know, I, uh, I, uh, I can't hear. And, and she started yelling at me. <laughs> and, uh, but no, I, and I, I, I mean, I went for about five or six weeks and I couldn't hear. And my confession every day was, I, I will hear. I'm going to hear. And, and uh, people would ask me, well, what are you going to do? I, it, it worked. They said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to hear. I told one guy at work, I said, I don't care if I have ears or not. If God tells me to hear, I'm going to hear. And God did not create me to, to write music and produce music and do the things that I do for me to not be able to hear. Amen. 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 And so I confessed the word, and, I, and that was my daily confession. Every time I prayed, that was what I prayed, and that's what I stood for. That's what I stood on. And uh, about two, you know, it's been two weeks ago because we didn't have a service last week. But I woke up that Monday morning and I could hear my hearing was back just as fast as it went away. It was back. I had somebody uh, put on, I, I shared the testimony on Facebook and I had somebody that, that, put, that responded on there uh, that, uh, that he had, had known, worked with a lot of clients that had the, the same, same thing that happened to them that happened to me. And not a one of them ever had their hearing returned. So everybody say, God is good. good. And I'm not bragging on me. I'm bragging on Jesus. God's word works. Don't ever give up. Keep standing on on the word of God. Amen. Amen. And so our youth is renewed by what we speak. You've got to speak the word of God. Amen. Amen. And then last last service, we talked about, started talking about principles of faith. Uh, And then we talked about how that in order to walk in authority, and I I use the scripture from Matthew chapter 8. We're not going to read it. but In order to walk in authority, you must be under authority. The authority that you walk in is determined by the authority that you walk under. If you don't submit to authority, you're not going to walk in authority. Amen. And so it's real important. You know, we teach our children how to have manners and and all that kind of stuff. That's important. All that is is basically learning how to walk under authority. When you teach your children to say yes, sir, and no, sir, and yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, and please, and thank you, and, and show manners, proper etiquette, all that is is basically training on how to walk under authority. Amen. And the more we walk under authority, the more we walk in authority. Amen? Amen. And then we talked about how that faith is demonstrated in worship. That uh, We read this scripture about the woman from Canaan that had, had a daughter that was demon-possessed, and and Jesus ignored her. 
And she kept coming to her, and the disciples said, send her away, she's bothering us. And then, then finally, uh, she gets to Jesus, and, and, uh, and, and she says, Lord, help me. And Jesus answered and said, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith, let it be to you as you desire. But before that, it says that she worshipped. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Everybody says she worshipped him. him. So faith is demonstrated in worship. It's demonstrated by by, uh, what we say, what we believe, and everything. And and walking under authority is also demonstrated in worship. And uh, even when when Jesus said, you know, it's it's not right to give the... the, uh, uh, said, uh, 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 let's see here. Said, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Her response was, "Yes, Lord. Even the little dogs eat the crumbs." What's interesting, even when the words that that Jesus spoke to her seemed to imply denial, she still worshipped and and appealed to the true nature of God. Amen. Always remember this: God is a good God. I must say, God is a good God. We need to always remember and appeal to God's good nature because God is good. When, God, when you think God is telling you something that's not good, remember his true nature. Amen? Amen? His true nature is always to bless you and always to provide for you. Now, sometimes we, we want God to bless us in one direction when he's leading us in another. Now, we need to get lined up to his way of doing things to walk in his blessings. I understand that. Amen? You need to be where God wants you to be to be walking in the blessings. That's important. But she positioned herself in agreement with Jesus in her worship. Jesus said one thing. She got in agreement with him and continued to worship. He said, it's not good to give the children's bread to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs. In other words, if I'm going to be a dog, I'm going to be your dog. Amen? I'm going to be your dog so I can have the crumbs that fall from the, from your table. And she positioned and aligned herself with Jesus, and she got her miracle. Now today, I'm going to talk about how that it doesn't take great faith to get results. Amen? Everybody say, it doesn't take great faith to get results. It just takes pure faith. Not a whole lot of faith, just a little bit of faith. Now, I'm not, I'm not belittling it, but, uh, but, but the point is, you don't have to be some spiritual giant to believe God. Amen? Mm-hmm. You don't have to climb to the top of the mountain to look down on everything and, and be on top of everything you know, spiritually to believe God. It takes a little bit of faith, but it takes pure faith. Amen? Mm-hmm. Now, in Matthew chapter 17... Jesus had been up on the Mount of what they call the Mount of Transfiguration. It was really it was a Mount of Prayer. Jesus took uh, some disciples, Peter, James, and John, went up on the mountain, and he began to pray. And as he prayed, he was transfigured before them, and God spoke to them. And he came to, as he came down from the mountain, verse 14, when they had come to the multitude, after they came down from the mountain, they came to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him, and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Gen- then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could not we cast it out? Thank God they had enough sense to go to Jesus and ask him, Why couldn't we do it? Amen. Because you understand, Jesus had sent them out before this time and sent them out and gave them authority. He said, I give you authority over over demon powers. Go out and cast out devils, heal the sick, all the things. He sent them out, and they had seen God do miracles. And so here, it's not like they didn't have a word from God. They had the authority from God to do this. 
But they asked him, he said, why couldn't we cast it out? So Jesus said to, to them, because of your unbelief. Everybody say unbelief. 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 Because of your unbelief. For assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed. Everybody say mustard seed. Mustard. That's a small, small amount of faith. If you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind goeth not out, but except by prayer and fasting. So unbelief is what robbed the disciples of the ability to cast out the demon. Everybody say unbelief. unbelief. So here we have faith, we have unbelief. Everybody say faith, faith. And, unbelief. and unbelief. Now, understand this. It's not all or nothing. You can have a little bit of faith and still have unbelief. Right. Amen? Amen? The problem is when you mix faith and unbelief, they are opposing powers and opposing abilities. So it's like you have a tractor chained to a tree to pull it up, but you've got another tractor in the opposite direction chained to the tree both pulling in the same direction. Guess what? Nothing's going to happen. Amen? It's not going to move. Why? Because you've got opposing powers and opposing abilities working against each other. So unbelief can be functioning in your life at the same time faith is functioning in your life. Amen? We know that from the Word. In fact, in the other account of this, when, when uh, in Matthew, let's see, in Mark, Mark chapter 9, Mark's account of it, uh, let's see here, what verse is it? Yeah, in, in verse uh, 22, often he is thrown in both into the fire, the, to, the father is talking to Jesus, often the devil is thrown his son in, both into the fire and the water to destroy him, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to them, if you can believe, Everybody say, if you can believe. If you can believe. All things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Everybody say, Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. <laughs> and then we know in, in, in other, other scriptures that, that doubt and unbelief can be in operation in, at the same time that faith does. It just stops your faith from operating. James says, in the book of James chapter 1, it says, if any lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives liberally to all men, and upbraideth not. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, without doubt. Amen? Amen. For he that wavers is like a, a, toss, a man tossed to and fro on the sea. Let, he, let him not think he'll receive anything from God. Because unbelief is an opposing force to faith. And it will stop your faith from being effective. So how do we deal with that? First of all, I think there are three different forms of unbelief. Number one is ignorance. Everybody say unbelief, uh, uh, ignorance. If you're ignorant, you, you don't know what to believe. When you're ignorant, you just don't know anything. I'm not, I'm not going to say stupid. I just said ignorant. Amen? And all of us are ignorant of some things. I mean, when it comes to nuclear science, I'm pretty ignorant. I, mean, probably, I would venture to say probably all of you are too. I think we're probably all in the same boat there. Amen? When it comes to certain things, we're ignorant. All that means is we don't have any knowledge. And, but the, the, the thing that we need to learn about is that Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. If you don't gain knowledge of what to believe, if you don't know what to believe, then you don't know what to believe. And, the, and you are a target for the devil to come and steal from you out of your ignorance. Amen. That's why we need to know the Word of God. Amen? Now some people just have a natural personality of faith in God. Their, their natural tendency is to believe God. But don't let that substitute for the need and necessity to know what the promises are. Amen. Amen. Some people are naturally skeptical. You overcome that with the Word of God. 
Even people that naturally believe everything, you, if you, need, you still need to have the foundation of the Word of God. So ignorance is one kind of unbelief. We overcome that with the Word of God. Amen? Everybody say, I overcome ignorance with the Word of God. The second form of unbelief is what I would call disbelief. Everybody say disbelief. And that's where you've been taught the wrong thing. You have knowledge, but you have wrong knowledge. You've been taught that Jesus doesn't heal anymore. That he only uses doctors. And if doctors fail, then it's just God's will for you to just die. Or it's God's will for you to just suffer the rest of your life with whatever affliction. And just because, you know, God only uses doctors. And if they can't cure it, you're just stuck. Well, that's wrong. That's wrong doctrine. That's doctrine based on experience instead of doctrine based on the Word of God. Now, all of us could point to situations where our experience didn't line up with the Word of God because none of us are perfect. Amen? Amen? I mean, we can all find things that, that say, well, my, that just didn't line up with the Word of God. Well, instead of getting under condemnation, learn from it. But don't change what you believe just because you had a bad experience. Amen. Even doctors have patients that die and they continue to write the same prescriptions because it's what they've been taught. They believe that this prescription will work and it'll work a certain percentage of the time. There's times it won't work, but most of the time it will work. So I'm going to keep writing. I'm not going to quit my practice just because somebody died. Amen? Well, doctors have enough sense to know that. That's even in the natural. We need to understand that when God gives us his word, we stand on the word of God, not on experience. Amen? Let God's word be the determining factor. Let God's word be the thing that settles it in our heart what we're going to do. Amen? So disbelief is also overcome by the word. Just like ignorance is overcome by the word, disbelief is overcome by the word. You need to read the word and find out what God has to say about it instead of what you've been taught, even if you've been taught it in church. Amen? Amen. Everybody say disbelief, disbelief is overcome by the word of God. Paul put it this way when he wrote to Timothy, study to show yourself approved to God, a worker who does not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Everybody say study. In the New King James Version, it says be diligent. Amen. In other words, we need to study, or read the word of God with diligence. Not just as a, you know, well, God, I've got to spend five minutes in the word, so well, let's see, what's the shortest two chapters I can read? Amen. Amen. Be diligent. I'm not saying we have to be legalistic about it, but, you know, when you have a relationship with someone, it, there, there, it, it takes a commitment to that relationship. Amen? Not legalistic, but relationally. It takes diligence. It takes diligence to be a good husband or wife. It takes diligence to be a believer. Amen? Be diligent to study the Word of God so that you accurately know the Word of God so that you can present yourself approved. When you present yourself approved, that means you please God. When you please God, it's because you've had faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So as we diligently study the Word of God, we are feeding our faith, and our faith is what pleases God. So we're approved of God. We rightly divide the Word of truth. This is how we overcome disbelief. Amen? Amen. And then the third form of unbelief, are y'all you you getting anything out of this? Yeah. The third form of unbelief is called unbelief. <laughs> so unbelief, now this is where your natural senses are overwhelmed with things that are contrary to the Word of God. This is what causes the unbelief that Jesus was dealing with with the disciples. This is where your natural senses are overwhelmed. And we, we get in situations, if you're, if you're battling with symptoms in your body, sometimes those symptoms 
cry out and, and you're in pain and you're, you're in anguish and, and you're suffering and things like that. And your natural senses can be overwhelmed. You listen to what the doctor says and what all your friends say and all this and that. And you're, you, can, you can get so tuned, in tune to your natural senses that your natural senses are just overwhelmed. And that creates a realm of unbelief that you have to deal with. Because remember, God is pleased by our faith. And unbelief is an opposing force to faith. Jesus said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you can speak to the mountain. He had just said, because of your unbelief, you couldn't cast this demon out. It doesn't take a lot of faith. You just have to get rid of the unbelief. So when our senses are overwhelmed, how do we deal with that? Well, we have to shut off our senses. Amen? If you're overwhelmed by how loud the television set is, what do you do? You turn it down. Right? If you're overwhelmed by driving too fast down the road, what do you do? You slow down. Whatever it is that overwhelms you, you deal with it by turning it down, by shutting it off. If you're overwhelmed by by something in your life, you need to shut off what is overwhelming you. When your natural senses are overwhelming you, you've got to find a way to shut off your natural senses. How do you do that? By prayer and fasting. That's what Jesus said. He said, because of your... Um, they, they, in Matthew 17, they, they came to Jesus and said, why couldn't we cast it out? Jesus said, because of your unbelief. Everybody say unbelief. For assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing, everybody say nothing. Nothing, nothing will be impossible to you. However, this kind does not go out, but by prayer and fasting. Now, people have read this and thought that Jesus was saying, this demon is too powerful. You can only cast this demon out by prayer and fasting. No. The name of Jesus and faith in the name of Jesus takes care of any demon. There's no demon that's powerful, that, that's so powerful that the name of Jesus can't cast out. Period. End of discussion. Don't give that much power to the devil. Don't give that much place to the devil. He's defeated. Amen. Amen. Jesus was not saying that the demon is too powerful for you. But yet that's what our religious mind has thought. Jesus was saying, you can't, there's some demons, and I've heard it taught, there's some demons that, are, that you can cast out easily. Some demons, you, gotta, you can't deal with them until you pray. I, I know people that, that deal with sick people and say, well, this person's got cancer, or this person's got that, so I've got to pray and fast for a certain amount of time so I have enough, so, you know, so that, that, that demon is especially hard to deal with, so we've got to spend more time in prayer and fasting so we can deal with that demon. Jesus was saying, you deal with the unbelief that stops you from believing God and stops you from exercising your faith effectively. You deal with your unbelief, the thing that's overwhelming your senses and stopping you from walking by faith. You shut off your senses by prayer and fasting. That kind of unbelief you overcome by prayer and fasting. If it's, if it's lack of knowledge, if it's ignorance, you overcome it by the word of God. If it's disbelief, you overcome it by the word of God. If it's, over, if, if it's unbelief because of your senses being overwhelmed, you've got to shut off your senses. And you do that by prayer and fasting. This kind of unbelief is dealt with by prayer and fasting. Makes sense, actually. Well, I don't know about you, that helps me. Because there are times that, that things, you know, when I was overwhelmed, when I couldn't hear for a few weeks, it was almost, almost five, five, six weeks that I couldn't hear. I mean, I could, I could it, it, what little bit, I could hear sounds, but it, it was like two doors down with all the doors shut. I mean, it was just, just overwhelming to my senses. And I had to shut off everything because, I mean, my mind would say, you're never going to hear again. You're not going to hear it. There's no cure for this. My mind would say that. But I refuse to give any place to it. And I'm not bragging on me. I'm just saying I had to shut off my senses. I had to press into God. I had to, I had to confess the word. I had to shut off the things that would tell me that. Amen? 
And you have to learn to shut off your senses. You have to shut them off. And Jesus was not saying that the devil's... There is no devil that's more powerful than the name of Jesus. Amen. Get that out of your thinking. It's not that the devil's that hard to deal with. The devil's easy to deal with. You just got to have your faith in, in God and get rid of the unbelief. It, takes, it doesn't take a lot of faith, just a grain of mustard seed. You know, I've seen, anybody seen those mustard seed necklaces? You know, uh, years ago I used to see them every now and I hadn't seen one in a while. But I, I, they, they put them in a, a, a little mustard seed in, into a little uh, teardrop thing, you know, for, for a necklace. It's a magnifying glass. You can't even see the seed without a magnifying glass hardly. Thank God he didn't say if you have faith as an avocado pit. <laughs> you know, I mean, we're two-thirds of the fruit is a seed. Amen? Amen? He said all you need is a faith as a grain of mustard seed. That means any one of us can qualify. Amen. Everybody say, I qualify. I can get a faith as a grain of mustard seed. That's not that much. Amen? I just got to get rid of the unbelief. When your senses are overwhelming you, and that, I'd say that's one of the things we deal with the most. And I, and I, I mean, we're learning. Uh, every time we come to church, we're learning more about the Word of God. So we're dealing with the ignorance part. We're dealing with the disbelief. We're, we're shattering the doctrines that, that we believe that were wrong by the Word of God. We're overcoming those things. Those are pretty easy to overcome. It's, it's the dealing with your senses when they're overwhelmed. That's where you have to learn. You've got to shut off the TV. You've got to shut off the radio. Whatever it is you've got to do, you've got to set aside yourself and set apart your time with God so that you are overwhelming your senses with faith instead of unbelief. Amen. I don't know about you, but this can change your life. Amen. This can change your life. I'm not talking about being legalistic about it. I'm just talking about relationally. We need to learn how to shut off our senses Get rid of the unbelief and keep our focus on Jesus. Keep our focus on faith, on the promises of God. Amen? Amen. Does that help you today? Yes, sir. Amen. There's a lot more I could say, but, but let me just say, we'll close with Mark eleven twenty two. Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, he's talking to the disciples, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart. So here he's saying basically the same thing I've been saying. Speak to the mountain, but don't let unbelief dwell in your heart. In other words, have a pure faith. Now, you can have thoughts that come against your mind and still walk in faith. Just because you have a thought come against your mind does not mean that you are yielding to unbelief. I heard Brother Hagin say, you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can keep it from building a nest in your hair. Amen. Amen. So just because a thought comes to you does not mean that you've yielded to unbelief. Mm -hmm. That's a lying thought, but you don't have to yield to it. You, it's not your thought. It's just a thought that comes to you. You don't have to yield to it. So speak the word, but don't doubt in your heart. Doesn't say it doesn't have any doubting thoughts come to his mind, but don't doubt in your heart. Don't doubt in your heart. But believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Amen? Amen. So we deal with ignorance by the word. We deal with disbelief by the word. We deal with unbelief, of the overwhelming of our senses by shutting off our senses, drawing close to God and hearing him. Amen? That bless you today?